Hi, we're the junior docents of Los Serenos to Point Vicente. Today, we're here to introduce the second episode of the TV Nature series, Peninsula Profile. The junior docents produced this series in collaboration with the Rancho Palos Verdes Educational Channel, RPVTV, and RPVTV's high school interns. For more information on becoming a Los Serenos docent, go to losserenos.org or find us on Facebook. Now, now enjoy, enjoy the, the show. show. You may know fossils to be a footprint in some rock. In many cases, this is true, considering that a fossil is what's left of plants and animals that once lived millions of years ago. These living things have remains, usually bones or shells, that are imprinted in rocks. There are three types of rock, igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary. But only sedimentary rocks are home to fossils. The most common types of sedimentary rocks are limestone, shale, and sandstone. When an animal or plant dies, its remains lie in sediment. Through lots of pressure and time, these sediments morphed, creating a unique stone that is left with the imprint of the remaining organism. But not all fossils form immediately. There are several types of fossilization that include freezing, drying, burial, carbonization, petrification, molds, tracks, and casts. The most common types of fossil come in the form of molds and casts. The process of molding begins when certain materials, like shells, lie in sediment until layers harden forming a mold around each object. Later, the organic material decays and disappears leaving the natural mold. This can also give paleontologists a general idea of what many animals look like before extinction. Casts are the remains of animals that may have been preserved from natural sediments that harden and retain the features of one's living animals. This is also used as a complex piece of evidence in the process of carbon dating. Carbon-14 dating is a method used by historians and scientists by relating different layers in the earth and using evidence such as fossils to create a figurative timeline with artifacts from different eras. It is sometimes hard to tell what time period a fossil may come from due to the constant recycling process of the rock cycle. This process keeps the rock in a slow but constant revolution of recreating rock using heat and pressure, and this can either help or destroy the creation of fossils. As rock regenerates under the tectonic plates of the earth, ground and pieces of geologic evidence are lost. However, the creation of new rock can bury animal and plant life and form new fossils. Some say that the most famous fossil of them all is the Megalosaurus. This was once originally thought to be a giant human who once roamed the earth. After considerable speculation, scientists thought this to be an unlikely candidate for the mystery animal. It was unearthed in England in 1676 and was identified as a dinosaur in the 1800s by a paleontologist named Richard Owen. Due to fossils, researchers now have a good idea of what kinds of animals roamed the earth in the land before time. Around 16 million years ago, seabeds were being deposited into Catalina Schist and they formed a rock called Altamir Shale, or Palos Verdes Stone, one of the many rocks that house fossils. Altamir Shale was formed during the Miocene Epoch. The two main geologic ages found in Palos Verdes are the Pleistocene and the Miocene. The Miocene being 14 to 16 million years old, and the Pleistocene being 50,000 to less than a million years old. Along the Palos Verdes Peninsula, there have been many fish, scales, shells, small creatures, and whale bones that have been fossilized and cemented into rock. Most of the animal fossils include fish, whales, seashells, and giant sharks. There are two types of fossils, depending on what kind of organism remains they used to hold, vertebrate fossils and invertebrate fossils. Vertebrate fossils being bones and teeth. The other kinds of fossils, invertebrate fossils, come from plants or animals that didn't have bones. Seashells are the most common. Soft body parts rarely fossilize. Usually only the hard parts of animals like shells and teeth and bones become fossilized. However, feathers, fur, and skin have also been found. Trace fossils are the signs that organisms were once present. Trace fossils can be tracks, footprints, trails, burrows, nests, leaf impressions, and feces. Great places to look for fossils around the peninsula include Ladera Linda Community Center, 
In the Upper Lanada Bay area in the early 1990s, Jim Madden, a construction contractor, found a shark fossil and loaned it to the Point Vicente Interpreter Center. The large fossil of the Mako shark can be found in the Coastal Cave replica exhibit, depicting the remains of the fossil found in none other than Palos Verdes. We're here with Joe Koch, and he's here to tell us a little bit more about fossils. Um, so Joe, I know about carbon-14 dating and that it's used to tell scientists when animals used to live, but can you tell us more about the process and how it used to bring animals back to certain eras in time? Sure, what it does is um, all animals when they're alive, they take in carbon, you might say, and they have a, a, a actual amount of carbon in their body. And then when an animal dies, uh, the carbon decomposes and basically leaves the bones or teeth or whatever. And then scientists can um, get a sample of a bone or tooth or wood and they can actually burn it and then get the amount of carbon that's left in the specimen. And by doing this, they can uh, determine the age because of uh, about 50,000 years is a half-life of carbon. So if there's only 50% left in there, it's about 50,000 years old. What exactly are index fossils? Index fossils are fossils that have a, a certain time range in their lives. Like trilobites lived, you know, from the Cambrian to the um, Permian. And uh, so if you find a fossil rock with a trilobite in it, you know, it's within that time range. Uh, what's nice with other index fossils, if they have another range that laps into the trilobite age, uh, you can uh, take it down even a closer date. So they're uh, fossils that have a very uh, limited or certain range, and they're called index fossils. What kinds of rock and PV host most fossils? Uh, most of it is the uh, Altamira shale you're sitting on right now. And because of the color and the quantity of uh, Altamira shale on the hill here, they used to commercially mine it, and it was called uh, Palos Verde stone. And most people still refer to it as Palos Verde stone today, but it's actually from the Altamira shale, which is between about 14 to 16 million years old. What kinds of fossils would you find in Palos Verdes? Well, Palos Verdes has actually two ages. Um, the Miocene with the Altamira shale would be the oldest, and it's between, uh, like I say, 14 to 16 million years old. And it's all marine deposits. Uh, many of the animals are similar to what you find living in the ocean today. There's whales, uh, uh, dolphins, fish, all the stuff found today. The only exception are the whales were smaller during the Miocene, and uh, of course sharks were larger, and we have some very large shark fossils to show that. But uh, basically it was uh, similar to the life we have today, and this Altamira shale was a deep sea deposit, much like the Catalina Channel. Uh, when it was formed, it was formed actually in Baja, off the Baja Peninsula, deep water, but because of the movement of the and San Andreas Fault, it uh, poof, pushed the um, beds up into where we are today. So Joe, tell us more about the Mako shark that's here in the Point Nascente Center. Uh, this is an incredible fossil. It's in the Altamira shale. Uh, like I say, it's between 16 and 14 million years old. And it's one of the best fossil sharks probably in the world. It's, um, it's the giant Mako, which is different, it's extinct now. It doesn't live today, but it's the one that evolved into the white shark we have of today. And uh, this specimen is incredible because sh sharks have cartilage, and usually when they die, it, it decomposes. And this thing not only has the, the teeth, cartilage, the vertebrae, but has a fin imprint and a wrinkled skin too. So it's an incredible, it's one of the best fossils in the world of a, of a mako shark. I understand that it came from Baja. How exactly did it get here? Well, it was uh, deposited in Baja uh, millions of years ago, but because of the movement of the San Andreas Fault, it uh, brought the beds up to where we are today. All right, thanks Joe for coming down here and talking a little bit more about oh, fossils. Well. Louis, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. The Point Vicente Lighthouse, with its trademark white cylindrical tower, was built in 1926 and marks the southwesterly point of the Palos Verdes Peninsula. The U.S. Lighthouse Service had placed it in operation due to petitions from shipmasters which feared the dangerous stretch of coastal water. The tower was built on eight acres deeded to the U.S. Lighthouse Service by the U.S. Army. After the light was completed, it was the brightest beacon in Southern California. It is known today as Point Vicente but over 200 years ago, Captain George Vancouver named the area Point Vincente after his good friend Friar Vincente of the Mission Buenaventura. In the early 1930s, the Pacific Geographical Society renamed the light Point Vicente, and in 1939, the U.S. Coast Guard took over the lighthouse operation. To the mariner, the Point Vicente lighthouse serves as an aid to navigation with its placement on the northern end of the Catalina Channel. 
The powerful Fresnel lighthouse lens was made in France in 1886 and is named after its inventor, French physicist Augustine Fresnel. The lens projects the 1,000-watt bulb 24 miles out past Catalina to help ships safely enter the Port of Los Angeles Harbor. As with all lighthouses, the Point Vicente light has its own characteristic flash. It rotates once every 40 seconds, is double-sided, and has two bullseyes so the mariner sees it flash two times every 20 seconds. This helps the mariners to identify the point, plot their positions, and avoid the nearby rocky shore. During World War II, the 1,000-watt light was replaced by a dim 25-watt bulb, and blackout curtains covered the windows. The coast artillerymen did not want the light to aid enemy navigation. After the war, the 1,000-watt bulb was reinstalled. The Point Vicente light continues to send out its beacon across the Catalina Channel, but the lighthouse keeper has been replaced by an automatic foghorn and electronic sensors that activate the light. The automatic foghorn is activated when visibility is less than 3 miles. When this happens, the foghorn blows every 30 seconds. The grounds at Point Vicente are much the way they were in 1926 when the light was built, but the housing facility is now home to the Coast Guard personnel and the old Foghorn building that once contained the big engine compressor that blew the fog signal has been turned into a small museum. The building, where the lighthouse keeper would stand watch, is now a radio center manned by volunteer civilians who are members of the Coast Guard Auxiliary. Their responsibility is to track distress calls from boaters in the Catalina Channel. The Point Vicente Lighthouse and the small museum are open to the public the second Saturday of every month except in March, when it is open on the first Saturday of the month for the annual Whale of a Day celebration, co-sponsored by the city of Rancho Palos Verdes and Los Serenos de Point Vicente. For recorded information on visiting hours for the Point Vicente Lighthouse, call 310-541-0334. Passing by, the residents of the Palos Verdes Peninsula have grown accustomed to the sight of the Point Vicente Lighthouse, standing right off the face of our cliffs and looking out into the sea. The tall white body has become largely famous as one of the many jewels of Palos Verdes, and even that of the South Bay, and was declared a local landmark in November of 1979 by the Rancho de los Palos Verdes Historical Society. But what most don't know are the true stories and histories of lighthouses, or the mysteries it has come to produce in the local area. There are two main purposes of a lighthouse, both directly relating to those navigating at sea. First is safety. Its powerful lens serves as a beacon of warning to mariners and their ships sailing close to land, averting them away from the coastline. The light that the tower emits must be able to stretch from miles on end and is required to be clearly visible during the day or in the black of night. Each lighthouse is also equipped with a foghorn, which is turned on whenever the fog is too thick to see the light out in the ocean. The second main purpose pertains to those located near the mouths of harbors. For both purposes, the lighthouse must be positioned at a location high above sea level, where sailors and their ships can easily see the beam. An alternative to this is on a small island right off the coast. Usually elevated by a small hill or rocks, the lighthouse can then be closer to the harbor entrance or dangerous areas where it is used as a landmark to easily guide ships of all sizes correctly into the area. The concept of the lighthouse is nothing new. Ever since the first ship was built and men began to sail the seas, they have deemed it necessary to construct beacons of warning or name landmarks to help lead seafarers to land safely. The first lighthouse on record was located on the island of the pharaohs in ancient Egypt, later to become one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Soon after, Ptolemy issued the building of the pharaoh's light, notably one of the most famous Egyptian projects ever built in direct relation to the sea. The pharaoh's light was the largest tower of its time and was used for ferrying ships of Egyptian grain and soldiers for war. As the Egyptians had no electricity, the pharaoh's light cleverly produced one of the earliest forms of an effective signal in history. A massive fire was to be lit atop the tower at night, and a large circular mirror to reflect sunlight during the day. Over the centuries, this basic template for lighthouses has been modified and advanced by seafaring countries all over the world, such as in Greece. On any given day, a passerby can look onto the Point Vicente Lighthouse and think nothing abnormal of it. They would see its tall white body gleaming in the sun, set within a picturesque scene before the ocean and surrounded by a small cluster of local palm trees. 
But aside from local admiration, the Point Vicente Lighthouse has had many tales and untold backstories that lie beneath it. One such aspect leans towards a spookier rumor, and one unknown to most of the public. For security reasons, during World War II, the 1,000-watt bulb was replaced with a 25-watt bulb. After the war, the light was restored to its original intensity. Unfortunately, the power of the light became a bother to the residents whose homes it affected during the night. To assess the situation, the inside windows facing the land were given a coat of white paint. As the residents of Palos Verdes know, as well as anyone else living off the coast, early mornings and nights are often settled with a dense layer of fog. Rolling in from the ocean, the fog becomes so thick that seeing to the other side of the street even becomes difficult. It is here, when the fog is most heavy and the night is turning in, that some have claimed to see a ghost haunting the lighthouse. As the powerful light would rotate round and round, to watchers it seemed that a woman in a flowing gown paced the catwalk around the tower. The ghost-like figure came to be called the Lady of the Light. Never in clear view, but often appearing as an apparition or shadow, many different stories have been told of her reasons for staying close to the tower. Some say she is the ghost of the first lighthouse keeper's wife, and that one foggy night she stumbled off the edge of a cliff. Others say the ghost waits the return of a lover lost at sea. The U.S. Coast Guard, who now occupies and maintains the lighthouse, has a more scientific explanation. According to the U.S. Coast Guard publication, the ghost appeared whenever the light passed through the painted surface of the inward glass. Creating a strange reflection, the bulb would send an arc of light forming what seemed to be a hazy outline of a woman. In 1995, the room containing the lens received a thicker layer of paint, which ended the spirit's stroll around the catwalk. Despite the varied explanations for the Lady of the Light, the lighthouse has captured the attention of psychics and ghost hunters, drawing them to our coastline in hopes of getting a glimpse at the famous ghost. <laughs>